welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God, but so do you. You need God just to listen today so you can hear and not be distracted because God wants to say something to you. So let's go before the Lord, put our hearts before God. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We thank you, Father, that the teacher of the church is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. We're so grateful to be in the house of the Lord this day, Father. Cause your word to become alive on the inside of us, and we'll give you the praise. Bless us this day. But Lord, don't just bless us. Bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, and Pentecostals. We thank you, God, for Calvary chapels and Harvest, and thank you for the Oasis. We thank you for Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, the Way, the Will, Well. Uh, we thank you for Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, lots of great churches out there, Lord. Bless them this day as you would bless us, and God will give you the praise, give you the glory. Lord, bless our Catholic brothers and sisters. Bless our Adventist brothers and sisters. God will give you the praise and give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. With a great big shout, we say amen. amen. Go with me, if you will, to Hebrews. In the sixth chapter of Hebrews, we're going to verse number 11. We go line upon line, precept upon precept. In the word of God, for those of you that are following us, you're going to be excited about today. In fact, if you're making notes, here's the title, Completing Life with Godly Diligence. And notice the word godly is highlighted here. Because there's two kinds of diligence. While you're getting there to Hebrews, the sixth chapter, let's talk just for a moment. There's two kinds of diligence. There's diligence of the world and then the diligence of God. The diligence of the world is really fascinating. It's where you, you know, you have a stiff upper lip or you, you have, if you will, a, a tenacity, you have a determination to complete something. But the, we find that the diligence of the world only goes so far in your own ability. And until you bring in the ability of God that has you to complete the task that is set before you, we find ourselves oftentimes falling short. Example of that, if you've ever started a diet in your life and never really completed the first couple of days, you're very diligent. Maybe the first week you're diligent. The second week you're not as diligent. Third week you start feeling pretty good about yourself and start nibbling them before you know it. You're not diligent at all. We have an understanding of worldly diligence and we try to apply it to the word of God when God's diligence is different. And as we look at that today, we're going to see a difference. So when God makes a statement about diligence, he may not be talking in terms that you and I completely understand. Let's talk about it a little bit more. First, let's take a look at the verse, if you will, Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verse number 11, makes this statement. And he says this, and we desire. Don't you know that God desires for your life to be benefited? In every area of your life. God loves you. God wants to bless you. God wants to pour his life into you. wants to give you direction. He wants to give you insight. He wants to take you to the places that you're going to be blessed. You say, then why doesn't he just do it? Why doesn't God, if he loves me, just bless me? Why doesn't God, if he loves me, just take care of these? Why doesn't he take me to the places where I need to be? Why is it that oftentimes I find myself wanting, oftentimes feeling as if I'm drowning in life instead of going forward in life? It's because oftentimes we do not apply the principles that are going to get us to where we need to be. God loves us doesn't mean that he's going to do everything for you. God loves you doesn't mean he's going to just take care of and open every door for you. And you can just get along. There's a responsibility that each and every one of us have. And that's why he's given us the word of God. The word of God is the insight. It's the manual on how to live life. And if you don't know how to live life, you won't live it any other way but the way you've been taught by society, 
our social system. But when you live life according to the B-I-B-L-E, because you know the Word of God, the Bible told us from a few weeks back that that's what a mature Christian is all about. Maturity, remember, is even different with God. Our maturity is getting old. Our maturity is reaching a certain age. Our maturity means you've been around for a while, but the maturity of God is different in understanding. A mature person can be young in age, but applies the word of God. If you apply the word of God to your life, guess what? In every situation, you're going to find yourself being a mature person. If you do not apply the word of God, then you're going to find yourself as being immature. So now God comes along and he makes us a statement. He's encouraging us by telling us that he has desires for us. And the desire that he has for us is really fascinating in this verse. That each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance. You see the words full assurance? It means to full faith, confidence. Uh, having a full understanding, standing strong in the things of God, of hope until the end. God wants you to, whatever it is that you're going to start, finish at the end and be successful. Doesn't want you to go halfway, doesn't want you to go three quarters of the way, doesn't want you to get something started and never finish it, doesn't want you to go just so far with your salvation, but you're to carry your salvation all the way. There's a day coming. When there's an end. And you need to fight a good fight. We saw in scripture that there's people. They didn't have their faith. They didn't have, if you will, their salvation taken from them. But they walked away from their salvation. And we see that in the last days. Hear, hear me now. The Bible makes it very clear that in the last days, there'll be people that'll be falling away, the scripture says. You can't fall away from something unless you're in something. There's people that will turn their back and leave because they follow the ways of the world. My job and your job is to be diligent to the end. In every area, with our marriage, with raising our children, with our schooling, with our jobs, with our profession, with our business, that we be diligent to the end. If you apply worldly diligence, that is that you just have a you know, true grit of determination. It may only last for a little while, and then you might give up. But if you apply, listen to me now, godly, if you will, diligence, and there's a different, and most people don't understand that. So when he has a desire that each show the same diligence, he's talking about a godly diligence, not a diligence based on your courage or strength personally by yourself, but a diligence based on God and you together working to accomplish what it is that God has called you to. Is anybody listening in the house of the Lord? And if we understand that, then we can see some things that are very true. As the Spirit of God spoke to me this week about what to minister to you, he took me to 2 Timothy in the fourth chapter. And there we find that Paul is writing to Timothy. And as he's writing to Timothy, he's encouraging Timothy to keep on keeping on, to be diligent to what it is that God has called Timothy to. And you know, that's that same principle with us. The problem with Timothy is faced with a world that's very strange. That world that a lot of people don't want to hear sound doctrine. A lot of people want to have tickling of the ears. In other words, they want someone to come in and amuse them. They want someone to come in and tell their little fables and stories. They want someone to come and talk to them and make them feel good about where they're at, even if where they're at is completely compromised with God but to make them feel good and they hire people to bring them in and here Paul is writing to Timothy saying Timothy you got to press on you got to be diligent you got to keep on going in the ways of God and he shows literally Timothy the way to do that we can learn from that same situation we can learn from their condition do you know why because like Timothy we live in a crazy world, absolutely nuts. Have you noticed at all? Recently, let me give you a little illustration. Recently, some young people were surveyed. They were asked, how do you believe 
The world is coming to an end. Do you know what their number one response was to how the world is coming to an end? Number one response, werewolves are going to take over the world. Is that nuts? Listen to this. Number two response. You want to know how the young people responded on how the world will end? The second most popular response is zombies will take over the world. Now, you may laugh all you want, but these are the future people who are going to make decisions in the future for the economy and the direction of life for a society and social systems. And you had better know and better be strong in the diligence of the word of God or you will be pulled off his track. And that's exactly what he's talking about. So all of us need to know how important it is. So today, instead of just telling you you need to be diligent, which I've done, I want to show you how to be diligent in godly terms. Is anybody listening? It's very important. So how to live out life with godly diligence. Not just to live out life with diligence, but with godly diligence diligence and there's a difference the first one that i want you to make a note of is the word attitude if you have the right attitude it's going to make a big difference on how you live out life in a godly attitude or not attitude is very important it's almost like a strut it's almost like having some strength on the inside of you. And that strength on the inside of you that gives you the strut has got to be God himself. The attitude that we're looking for is not an attitude of determination. Let me say it again. The attitude we're looking for is not an attitude of determination. The attitude that we're looking for is an attitude of reverence to God, and in our reverence to God, we become determined or diligent to complete the work. As Paul writes to Timothy, if you'll go there with me, 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, and in verse number one, he makes this statement in verse number one. I charge you. First three words, I charge you. You know, we don't talk in terms of I charge you to do this, I charge. You know what he's saying? He says, I am not making a polite request. I am in your face about doing this. In order for you to complete the task that God's got set for you, before you, before you to be diligent that you need to be in this tough, crazy world that you live in, Timothy, I'm telling you, here's how it, you need to do. You need to get it on. And Paul is like in the face of Timothy. I charge you, therefore. And now he makes a statement. And the statement that he makes is an awe of a statement that brings us immediately, and at least should, to a place of incredible reverence. He says, therefore, before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearance and his kingdom. In other words, he just makes a fact. Listen, I'm telling you to do something, and God Almighty is watching, and God Almighty is the one that judges. Someone said, God doesn't judge anything. I want you to know something. God judges everything. He has called himself in Scripture a judge because he's going to judge the living and the dead. Do you know what that means? You better have a reverence, a reverence for God. Listen to this. That contains two things. I respect God on one hand. Flip the coin on the other side of the coin. I'm in fear of God. Don't mess with God. Somebody ought to say amen to that. And without that, what we do is we live our life diligent to our own ability instead of diligent because we fear God. 
I need to say, I love God so much, I wouldn't dare do that. I love God so much, I will not give up. I love God so much, I will not be convinced that some zombies are coming back or some crazy world things taking place. I don't care what society says. I love God too much. I don't care what the social systems say. I don't care what the economics dictate. I don't care what the politicians say. I don't even give a flip what the church says. If God said it, that settles it. I love God. I'm committed to God. And that's the attitude we need to have. He's the God of judge of the living and the dead. Don't mess with him. And without that kind of an attitude behind your diligence, what happens is you will walk away from Oftentimes you'll say, I don't want to do it. I don't like doing it. Uh, this is too hard. This is too tough. Let me tell you something. I cannot give up because I know too much about God. I cannot give up because I love God too much. I cannot give up and pack off because God is too important. And there's a day coming when the eastern sky is going to split and Jesus is coming. And it might be today. And I want to be ready for him. He's the judge of the living. He's the judge of the dead. That's called reverence. And it's an attitude that you have that keeps you going. Most people don't have that attitude. Let me just say this to you. If you come to church once in a while and you think of yourself as I love God as one of the things in life that you love, you're wrong. Some people love God like they love pizza. They love God like their favorite ice cream. They love their favorite ice cream. They love God about the same way they love everything else, their car, their business, their life, their who they are. Your love for God has got to be greater than anything this world has to offer. Your commitment to God is greater to him than anything this world has to offer. And listen to what I'm going to say to you. If your reverence level is low and God is just something in your life, you better make the change to make God everything in your life because you will be left behind. And it's important for us to know that. Says, I charge you, therefore, before you. First thing that we all understand it's got to be an attitude. My attitude is I reverence God so much I wouldn't dare to go to that spot or do that thing or be involved in something other than what God would have for me. And you can work on your reverence level. We all started off with God being treated as common. He's just something in our life. And you have to work at him becoming greater and greater. You build your own reverence level for God. How big is God to you is determined not by how big God is, but how big you see him. Are you following me? And for all of us that are in this, this reverence level is mighty important. And it gives us the attitude for the diligence that we're going to take. Let me make this statement. You ought to write it down. It's a good one. Godly attitude is not achieved by sheer determination, but by great godly reverence. We can always have sheer determination for diligence, but a godly attitude that is the foundation of godly diligence is brought about by a depth of relationship, of reverence. And it's vitally important that we never stay the same in our relationship with God. What you were last year better not be what you are this year. And what you are this year isn't good enough for next year. Because your heart is what this is all about. And it's your call, not God's. I love the Christians that are such babies. They say, God, make me a great Christian. If I was God, I'd just slap you on the head until you finally give up and get in there and make yourself a great Christian. What else does he have to do? He's already gone to the cross, already sent you the Holy Spirit, already given you his word, already empowered you. What else does he got to do? 
Now it's your call, your choice to make yourself a great Christian and be what God would have you to do. There's a responsibility we have to have, the right attitude. And the right attitude comes from a great depth of responsibility of having a great reverence for God. Number two, we're talking about how to live out life with godly diligence. You ought to have the attitude, number one. But I love this, you've got to have perseverance. Perseverance, I love the middle of the word perseverance is the word severe. What he's saying is you keep on going when life is severe. You don't give up, you don't back off, you don't quit. You don't say it's too hard, you don't say God's not interested. You know that God is with you whether you get your answered prayers today or tomorrow, whenever. Doesn't matter when the prayer is answered, it matters whether or not you're going to keep God diligently in your heart through the whole process. And you and I have got to have perseverance. So many people give up when the pressure comes. So many people quit. So many people start doubting God. I prayed and I didn't get an answer. Oh, God, woe with me. You must not care about you. You must not love me. Let me tell you something, my friend. God loves you. God cares about you. Went to the cross and no one else did and died for you. There's no devil or demon in hell that ever went to the cross for you. God loves you. He doesn't have to prove it again. You have to prove the fact that this is as simple as this. You may not get the answer to your prayer right now. You may not get all the little blessings you think you ought to have but during this process you're going to persevere and keep God first no matter what the results are. Perseverance. Going to keep on keeping on when the rest of the world gives up and they follow their zombies. (laughs) You think it's stupid. I talked to a guy one time. He was 19 years old. He was having problems. And this church just started. He was 25 then. We were brand new, a year old. He was 19 years old. He came in to see me. I said, "Uh, how are you doing? He says, fine. I said, what's the problem? He says, I don't know. I don't have anything to live for. I said, why? You can do anything you want to do. I mean, as long as it's in the word of God, you can be what God would have you to be. You can become whatever... You believe God can, wants to do for you. As long as it's aligned up with the word of God, you can believe God for great things. This 19-year-old looked at me and said, you mean I can be anything? I said, yes, you can. As long as it's God, it's the will of God. He went on, he says, can I be Fonz? I said, what did you say? He said, could I be Fonz? You see, I have always wanted to be the Fonz. Now, some of you don't remember happy days. You're too young to remember happy days. It was a comedy on television that brainwashed this kid to become, he, we saw it as a laughter thing, he saw it as a serious lifestyle. You have a whole generation seeing zombies and, and what are they called? vampires as a serious lifestyle that are going to make a decision over your old age. By the way, he never became the Fonz. <laughs> In other words, guys, here's the problem, is that if we don't have an attitude that we're going to persevere through all the pressures, the pressures are going to get us. And we can do all things through Christ who does what? Strengthens us. Is anybody listening? All things are possible to him who does what? Believes. Perseverance. Listen to what he writes again. If you go with me into 2 Timothy, let's take a look at the second verse through the the fourth verse of 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. In 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, it says these words. Peace, preach the word. Now listen to this. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Then he comes along, convince and rebuke and exhort with all long-suffering teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. It's not maybe. For the time will come when they, meaning people, will not endure sound doctrine. In other words, have you seen it in America already? 
you can give them a Bible or a reason for believing what you believe, they laugh at you. And a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they have heaped up for themselves teachers. In other words, people who will amuse them, people who will tell them stories, people make them comfortable in their complacency. Then he goes on and he says, we're talking about perseverance, watch this. And for they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. In other words, you're going to have to persevere through the problems of life. But all things are possible. I said it a million times, we don't camp in the valley of shadow of death. We go through the valley of the shadow of death. There's another side and most of us need to know how to get there. We're talking about how to live out life with godly diligence. Is anybody listening? Yeah. Would you like to have another one? Yeah. How to live out life with godly diligence. Number three, goals. You're going to have to have a goal. Man, a lot of times people don't have any goals at all. They just live out life and exist. Existence is not a goal. It's just a function. You need to have a godly goal in your life. You need to know that God is directing you to do something. And most likely the things that are most simple oftentimes are the things that God is directing you to. The housewife that stays home and takes care of the wife and takes care of the kids, and trains up the children in the ways of the Lord, preaches the gospel to them. The husband that goes out and works and labors and brings his paycheck home and hugs his kids and then goes and tells them about Jesus. I'm telling you, there's no greater ministry on the planet. And that is one that each and every one of us ought to achieve in our life. That we ought to have goals in life. Sometimes our goals are, 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 that, are, that, are, that are, if you will, identified by money and prestige and power numbers and people. Let me tell you something. If everything that had money, people, and, and, and uh, numbers uh, was, if you will, spiritual, then Las Vegas would be the most spiritual city in all of the planet because they have people, money, and, if you will, numbers. It's not about that. Sometimes the simplest goal is the one you just know that God has called you to do and you fulfill that goal. In fact, look at it with me, if you will, verse number five, which is really powerful. In 2 Timothy 4, chapter, verse five says this, but be watchful for all things. Endure afflictions. That goes back to number two, doesn't it? Do the work of evangelists. Fulfill your ministry. Now watch this. Take the word ministry and put in there life's calling. You can put anything in there. You can put your business. You can put everything in there. You can put your home, your family, raising your kids. Whatever it is, fulfill. Listen, our view of success is money, prestige, power, recognition, acceptance, and approval of men. But God's view of success is different. Did you know that God's view of success is fulfillment? Fulfilling what it is that God's called you to do. Doesn't have to be big. Doesn't have to be powerful. Doesn't have to include multitudes and gobs of everything. It just has to be this is what you're called to, this is what you're gonna fulfill, and you're not backing off until you do it. That's good news. Notice how he says, fulfill your ministry if it's really big, powerful, and rich, and everybody recognizes you as somebody important. Didn't say that. He said, fulfill whatever it is that you're called to do. That's, that's what God's success is. God's success is when you do what God's told you to do. You are now successful. Somebody ought to say amen. <laughs> Very important for all of us to see. We're talking about important how to live out life with godly Diligence. Number one is what, remember, we have a, a godly attitude that comes from reverence. Number two, we have, if you'll remember, perseverance. There's going to be times of trouble and problems and pressure, but we're going to push through 
We're never going to stop and keep, give up. We're going to push through because we've got God on the inside of us that empowers us to do that. Number three, we've got goals. Those goals are whatever it is that God has said for us to do. Number four, last one, you've got to have examples. In order for you to get where you need to go, God has given you many examples of people who have gone before you. In the Old Testament, for an example, it was David. In the Old Testament, remember, it was uh, Abraham. In the Old Testament, it was Elijah and Elisha. In the Old Testament, how about Joseph, who pushed through and diligently stayed until the end? I would have given up. How about, how about, if you will, David was persecuted by Saul and running all of his life. Uh, Jeremiah, who get before you. These are people. In the New Testament, Peter, James, John. Have you ever thought about the goal? Paul writes these words, follow me as I follow Christ. Have you ever thought about how he followed Christ? We look at Paul today and we say, man, he's amazing. Writer of two-thirds of the New Testament. Great man of God, performed great miracles, won many people to the Lord. What an apostle, started great churches. Did you know that this man, while he was doing what he was doing, had no idea the effect that he had? Did you know that what you're doing today that seems nothing to you, how do you know what God can do in the future? How do you know how many lives can be changed? You have no idea. Stop and think about it. God gives Paul a mandate. That means he's got orders from God. He says, go tell the people about the time of grace that's coming upon the church. This time of grace, they had never heard about it before. They never understood it. And then God says to Paul, there's many things that you've got to suffer. Wait a minute. Give me a, a mandate, tell me what to do, and then bring in in the same sentence, suffering? Hello, give the ministry to somebody else. I don't want to suffer. The guy is beaten up, thrown in prison. His back is broken open. Blood is all over the place. He goes on a ship, it sinks. It breaks up. He's holding on day and night onto a piece of wood. Can you imagine what he thought day and night, holding on in the middle of the sea on a piece of wood, wondering, where are you, God? What's going on? This doesn't make sense. You wanted me to preach the gospel. You wanted me to tell those people about Jesus. And I have done that, and I'm willing to do that. But I keep getting thrown into prison. They put me in stocks. They beat me. He says, and then I'm in the water day and night. Then I get to the land and a poisonous snake bites me. Like, give me a break, God. Does it ever give up? And then Paul writes these words. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. Man, right back to persecution. But he kept on going. You and I can look at him as an example and look at all the biblical illustrations as examples of people who had times of trouble and pressure who never knew what they were doing. But what they did changed the world. Did you know? that today that there's more reading on Paul's writings than any other reading that takes place in the entire planet. Did you know more people read Paul's writings every day than any other literature that's ever been written on the planet on a daily basis? My goodness sakes alive. Here's a guy that didn't even know he was going to do it. Here's a guy that's writing the scripture from a prison cell. Here's a guy that's beaten, stopped at every turn of the road. Here's a guy that becomes a prisoner in Jerusalem. Here's a guy with his own brother and don't care about him. Here's a guy with his own brother and turn their back on him. He comes to Jerusalem. Where's Peter, James, and John? Do they come to his rescue? No, they stay out of the picture completely. Everybody else has taken an oath to kill the guy. Oh my goodness, he's in prison for two years in Jerusalem. Where is he? He's got the lousiest ministry on the planet, yet he's got the ministry that changed the lives of every single one of us in this place and you and I are not any different there are examples for us yes it's going to be tough yes we're going to have to fight to the end yes we're going to have to hold on to our faith when the world says you're crazy 
Yes, you're going to be somebody, but you have such a reverence on the inside. You know too much about God. You cannot, will not, shall not give up because you know something. You will persevere. You will go through the problem and not camp in the problem because guess what? You are persevering through the problem. And guess what? We have a goal to finish the course. And also, we have a many examples that have gone out before us, including our own Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. So, real quick, I'm out of time. Proverbs, the 10th chapter, verse 4, says this. He who has a slack hand, that's one who gives up, ends up how? Poor. But his hand of the diligent makes him what? Rich, not talking about just terms and money, talking about every area of your life. That's where well wealth comes in. Watch this. In Proverbs 13, 4, it says these words. The, the soul of a lazy man desireth and has nothing, but the soul of a diligent shall make him rich. Your call, your choice, when God says, I desire that you be diligent to the end. We are determined. Because we reverence God, we're prepared for the persecution. We have goals, and we have great examples of people who have made it. We can do this. If God spoke to you today, give him a great big <laughs> praise the Lord. We do that. Hey, real quick, I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. So let's take just a moment, and then I'll let you go. Everybody remain seated. Nobody get up. When you get up during this period of time, you disturb people. Let the ushers finish up, and you sit still. I want to make sure. Now, I want you to check yourself out. Did you know the Bible says it's okay to check yourself out? In fact, you should do that. Make sure you're right with God. Because if you're not, then you have a divine appointment with God. You had a lot of appointments in your life. You had appointments with doctors and plumbers and physicians and, if you will, painters and attorneys and all kinds of people, but now you have an appointment with God. God brought you here for a reason. Today is your day of salvation. Let me tell you something. Let me ask you this question. What makes you think you're going to get to heaven? If you're not going to make it to heaven, then where are you going? You think you're just going to evaporate? According to the scripture, you're going to go to hell, and someone needs to tell you. You do not want to go to hell, so you ought to listen to what I'm going to say to you. Because I'm going to share with you the simplicity of how it is to get right with God. Jesus Christ went to the cross, died a beaten, bloody mess for you. You can listen to what it's going to take for you to get into heaven. Jesus made it very clear that you cannot get to heaven your way. You cannot get to heaven my way. Nor can you get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get to heaven his way. And in John 3rd chapter, he tells us exactly how to get to heaven. He said, you must be born again. He didn't say, your mom and dad tell you you're a Christian if you're born in America, or if you're a nice guy and go to church once in a while and carry your Bible. Didn't say if you give your money to some charity that you're going to make it to heaven. Didn't say if you sit in, fit into the social system you're going to make it. He said, you must be born again. And a lot of people don't like those words, born again, because Hollywood has betrayed them as foolish people. But I want you to know I'm not talking about people being foolish and stupid. I'm talking about people do, being right with God. Here's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Let me tell you what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Someone needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth and stop playing religious games with you. You're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. Jesus came to this planet and he gave you all of his heart and gave you all of his life. A beaten, bloody mess nailed to the cross for you. No one else has done that. But Jesus did that for you. And if you believe that and you want to go to heaven... You're going to have to get there his way because you can't get there your way and you can't get there anybody else's way. 
and he says you must be born again. It's an all or nothing relationship and I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, you've heard about that. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. You know what he really said in those crude words? Lukewarm people that call themselves Christians are not real Christians at all and are going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. So let's define for you lukewarm so there's no misunderstanding. Lukewarm, a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Let me say that again. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. He's just along with all the other somethings. The truth be known, and he will never become something until you make him everything. That's what the truth is. And you do that by giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. Today is your day of salvation. Now here we are. We've laughed, we've sung, we've great listening to the word of God. God is good. You've been in his presence all this time. Why walk out of this place and be the same when you can get right with God today? Headed for heaven and denying your presence in hell. No one wants to go there, but it's your call. So here's what you need to do. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? Again, let's do it God's way, not yours or mine. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. I'll pop my hands and go, bang. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. You can put it right back down. Simple as that. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. Hold on. You want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. Yep, you might be. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. Because what? Because what? Because you're more concerned about what people see instead of what God sees? Come on. Today is your day of salvation. No one's that dumb. Get ready to put your hand up. Who cares what people think? I won't embarrass you, but you can't sit there and do nothing and expect to get right with God. Jesus did everything for you. At least you can do in a safe, friendly place is get your hand up for him. All across this auditorium, if you're in this place, I'm talking to you if you're not right with God. If you've never given him all of your heart, get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, you know who you are, get ready to put your hand up. Listen to this. If you're not sure, make sure. Maybe you prayed with Billy Graham at a harvest crusade, but have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? Today is your day of salvation. So let's stop messing around with God. And let's do it God's way by giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. Every one of us that ever got saved had to do it exactly that way. So today is your day. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. You get your hand up all over this place, back in the family rooms, in the foyer, even online right now, wherever you're at. God is waiting for you to get your hand up and then put it right back down. Let me see it. You can put it right back down. How simple, simple, simple is that? It's your call. Or you can sit there and stare at me when you know you need to get right and you've made your choice and you made your call and you don't want to have that image before God when you stand before him because the day is coming. You will have that day. Just like we saw with Paul. You will have that day. What's going to happen in that day with you? All across those auditorium, are you ready? Here it is. I'm counting to three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Thank you. Back here. Twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. Thank you. Twenty. You're pointing over here, but I don't see anybody. Over there. Twenty-four, twenty-five. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else on this side? Twenty-five. How many? Four, 25, 29. Thank you. See, you'd think pastors could count. 30. There's, oh, there's another one right here. Anybody else? There's 30 wise people that if we didn't do this, 30 people walk out of here. If they died, they'd go to hell. There's 31 right there. God bless you. Not everybody that comes to church is saved. Are you hearing me now? Anybody else? There's 31 wise people. Anybody else? 
Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 31 wise people. Isn't God good? Here's what I want you to do. All 31 of you, don't mess with me now. Don't mess with me now. All 30, I don't want anybody to leave either. You don't walk out of this place when we're trying to get people forward and you're going that way. No way, Jose. Are you hearing me? I want you to be respectful to the Holy Spirit. Those of you in the family room, I'm going to ask you to do something in just a moment. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. Get your stuff. Get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need a friend. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have. Let me say it again. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to get in the aisle. I want you to meet me right here in front. We will welcome all of you. All 30, in the foyer, if you raise your hand and you need to get right with God, get yourself in those doors, tell an usher, and they'll let you come forward. Every single one of you right now that raised your hand, anybody that should have, let's stand and welcome them. You get down here right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Amazing love. Come on. Come on home. He might be a die for me. Come on home. Amazing love. I know it's true. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. It's my joy to honor you. Amazing love. How can Come on, you can come. It's not too late. Come, 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 come. Come on. Come on home. They're coming. Give them a hand as they come. God, good. Okay, all of you, in a moment, you're going to pray and invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to go to heaven. You're not going to go to hell. Hey, hey, let me give you an idea. This is a good thing, so put a smile on your face. If you're going to hell, you ought to look like this. But you're going to heaven, so this is good, you know? So, come on. Okay, now look. All of you, look over here to your left. This is Pastor Joel. He's going to pray with you. He's going to give you some free information, tell you about a program we have to help you stay strong. We're putting in our application to be your pastor. We promise to love you, promise to fight for you, promise to teach you the word of God. Oh, it'll rub you the wrong way. It's supposed to. Get rid of all the flesh, get into the things of God. That's what this is all about. And you're going to have a great time in the future. He'll tell you about a one-year program that we have that's amazing. Make a left turn. The people who came with will wait for you. And follow Pastor Joel that way. Come on. Isn't God good? Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.